Good day, everyone, and welcome to the PwC webinar series. I trust we are keeping well at this time, and we thank you for making our time to attend our webinar today. My name is Toyebi Oyeyinka. I'm a senior manager in technology advisory, and I'll be your moderator for today's session. Our topic for today will be on building digital infrastructure resilience. I have some quick things of ground rule as it were before we kick off the session. Uh, we would like to let you know that the session is being recorded. This is to ensure that we can make the webinar available to you after the session so that you can go over it and also share with colleagues. Also, as you may have noticed that all um, attending mics are, are on mute uh, to ensure that we have good listening experience for all our attendees. However, I would like to hear from you. So during the course of the session, uh, we have a question and answer segment where we can take your question. If you look at the bottom right of your screen, you will see the, uh, the chat box, the Q and A. We will put your questions there at any time during the session and then we will take them during the course of the session. From my experience with use of technology, sometimes we may be impacted by the network. Uh, which is not outside our control, but we put in place measures to ensure that we also build resilience to ensure that you, you have a pleasant experience during this webinar. We have a lineup of speakers for you today. Uh, we will start with giving you an overview of the impact of COVID-19 uh, on our nation and economy. And then we have two technology subject matter specialists of in depth of building this part of our software. Yeah. We'll take your question and also provide you with survey feedback on the questionnaire you feel when you are registering for the session. Uh, so, so, without further ado, I would like to start the session. I'll be writing and then who is our partner, our financial services leader and chief economist of PwC Nigeria session. Thank you so much, Tariabi, for that uh, kind introduction, and thank you to everyone on our webinar today. Uh, I think we have uh, a great lineup on a very important topic, and it's uh, just well on the board. Uh, I just uh, wanted to say a few words in my role as Chief Economist of uh, PwC Nigeria. Uh, and I wanted to start by saying I think economists around the world were very slow to pick up on the economic impact. Pandemic. We go to late February, for example, and we're still economists saying that instead of the world growing 4% GDP growth, we're growing 2%, or some pessimists saying 1%. Uh, we had a prominent economist in South Africa who's late in mid March saying that the worst case for South Africa was that its worst case in 2020 was declining minus 1%. Already in the COVID-19 crisis. I think now we all recognize that this uh, the economic impact of COVID-19 is the greatest economic challenge on the face of our lifetime. Just so, just to make sure you see that in context. In the United States, there have been 17 million job losses in the last three months. The UK are predicting minus 35% GDP. At minus 35 in the next quarter, we're going to walk out in the news. In Australia, who's never had a recession in 30 years, with a 10% decline in GDP in the first half of 2020. And of course, yesterday we had the extraordinary spectacle of the oil price going negative in Canada, and also I'm sure you saw the headlines in the United States. Essentially, as people have nowhere to put the excess oil. In terms of the Africa impact, um, I think the numbers that people like the World Bank are saying is somewhere between a shrinkage of minus 3 to minus 5 percent of GDP, which given our uh, population growth will be the decline of incomes of 5, 6, 7 percent per capita, so a uh, massive, massive economic impact. And of course, Nigeria is also an oil economy, so I think we can expect worse than the average Africa. And these numbers always in the COVID-19 economic impact, uh, on the average. So we 
haven't hazarded even a projection. No one knows how to project these circles. We put on a guess. Nigeria's economy will show up from 5 to 10 percent this year, uh, which would mean that uh, we would have a high GDP per capita of somewhere 8 to 12 percent. To put this in context, when we had the deep recession in 2016, the GDP shrunk by 1.6 percent. So, the orders of magnitude are worse than that. I think we've all come to understand that uh, your spending is someone else's income. When we have these lockdowns around the world, essentially have millions of people whose income is going to be zero, that's the same situation in Nigeria, it creates economic problems, social problems, hunger problems, all of which we're facing now across Africa and Nigeria. So, sorry, I don't have any better news on the economy. The implications for everyone, uh, all of our clients in the financial services industry, it's just a critical time to manage through this. Many, many complex issues uh, we've been talking about on our webinars today, particularly complex on uh, IT resiliency. Uh, every, every financial services institution needs to face up and the leadership do the right, do the right thing in these circumstances. So let me stop there. As I said, I'm sorry I don't have any better economic news. Uh, let me stop there and hand it over to Thank you, Andrew, for, for that overview. I mean, key takeaway is that, that there's a lot going on, a lot of it which we can't control. But I guess we need to focus on what we can control, especially what is of value and importance to our clients and uh, customers. On that note, I'd like to invite our next speaker, Damola Yusuf. Uh, Damola is the technology advisory leader for PwC uh, across Africa, the Statist Fair. He has over 25 years' experience in the development of IT strategy and architecture and has been involved in large scale projects both in Nigeria and the UK. He has provided assistance to financial institutions in Nigeria in the areas of business process review, IT due diligence, IT strategy. He has completed many years of experience supporting C suite of banks across the region and the key decisions, including multiple stakeholder groups, regulators and market operators. Please welcome Damola across the Uh, thank you, Toyo, for that um, long introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, welcome to today's uh, very nice event. Um, I hope you are all well and keeping safe. So, my uh, session today will cover a high level overview of the key challenges in the I will also share some of the highlights on uh, what we find um, the, the responsibility that we are seeing in some other uh, territories. So, the, the, before I get to the, to the slide, it's actually important to note uh, that the financial services um, Industry, especially the bank, uh, arguably the most prepared uh, industry for the current situation we find ourselves in. This is because um, most of them, almost, almost everybody is uh, they are currently at uh, the stage of uh, a digital transformation before COVID. And that has actually has been preparing them for the <laughs> like I have a, a personal example, as far as the lockdown is concerned, I've not seen any difference in um, the way I interact with my bank from lockdown up to now. I'm looking at the screen here in the way it is. Currently, I've been practicing some of the things that we did. Practicing social distancing with the banking hall for quite a while. Um, access, um, 
Uh, do I acknowledge him that the industry has some uh, experts? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He's preparing for situations like this. There are still challenges.
talking about this and about to do this. Uh, we write a number of things that we have to do. We also have to talk about trying to take advantage of the following situation. Uh, and we have to do that. 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 We are talking about the and then the last item for what well, is a business continuity plan. So I'm very certain now that the current situation has tested your BCP every day. So the key question is what are you doing to invite this within the current reality? Are you coping with uh, getting around the constraints of um, getting uh, IT support to
Thank you, Damola, for that um, very instructive presentation. I mean, it is clear in this new digital normal that what is actually what we do and not where we go. So on that note, I'll be inviting our next speaker, Alfred Gagoka. Alfred is a senior manager in our technology consulting practice with over 20 years experience working in different jurisdictions. He has led many business transformation initiatives for financial services clients with strong focus on customer centricity, digital innovation, and solution for asset-based consulting. He is also the co-lead for cybersecurity and strongly advocates for adopting a zero-trust approach for me measuring or managing cyber risk. I invite Alfred to speak now. Thank you, Toby, um, for that um, very warm welcome and um, warm introduction. Um, once again, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for joining um, this webinar series. Um, COVID-19 is also referred to as a global coronavirus um, because it's a, it's a new strain that humankind has never experienced before. What is not new is that this is a crisis that organizations have to respond to as best as they can, given the restrictions and impact um, imposed by this pandemic. In dealing with this crisis, we at PWC believe clients go through three distinct phases. The first phase is the pre COVID or the preparation stage. Uh, this is where, as I said earlier on, they have been developing their PCP plans. Very for an eventuality, and then it happens. The next stage then is the response stage, where organizations will try and scramble and try to stabilize the organization so they can keep on serving customers and have as little impact as possible to the operations. This is also the stage where we try to identify the gaps that they have and opportunities. We step into the third and final stage, which is where they try to have to strategize and ensure that they emerge stronger from a crisis such as that in experience with um, COVID-19. In my, my session this afternoon, um, we're talking about building a digital infrastructure fields, um, largely from two perspectives, one from a digital office and one from a digital infrastructure. Given this COVID-19 lockdown and the various impacts, I'm sure we've all heard the term new normal or new ways of working. Our workplace will never be the same again. Um, and this, you know, constant is working remotely and the ability of organizations to push boundaries in terms of what is possible for the front office, the middle office and the back office especially for financial services organizations that you saw. So in effect, uh, most of the uh, processes to do with operations, settlement, HR, finance, even customer care now being run from people's homes remotely, um, given the impact of COVID-19. Um, even though the channels our clients are accessing to access our products and services, whether in insurance or in banking, Building asset management. Um, and all this is made possible um, through digital infrastructure. Um, so, so that is really the theme of my, my presentation, looking at the response stage to where you identify the gap that you have and to move on to strategize where you can emerge from that. I'm pretty pre COVID, um, most of business world was becoming more aware in terms of global and mobile working, um, digitally, remotely. 
and this has now become sort of a standard operating procedure for most organizations. And I would like to give an example of PwC, where we transitioned um, most or nearly all our operations and services um, back office to, to cloud. Um, we use Google Mail, um, Oracle, Cloud, Salesforce, I can go on and on, and that has put us in a position, in a full position, um, to be able to respond very quickly to any changes in our operating model, which has enabled us to respond quickly to COVID-19. So our own response was already laid down some time ago when we transitioned to digital infrastructure and also uh, a digital office where our colleagues and employees could work remotely and serve our clients we have degradation in service and our support for clients as well. So what we're saying with COVID-19 and post-COVID, um, there's an expediency in terms of organizations um, taking a strategic approach in how to design and organize their workplace, considering all stakeholders um, and employees and how they interact. So from our co-workers to customers to vendors to suppliers, partners, leading to friends and family, because that line between um, working and being with your family and being in touch is somewhat blurred now the lockdown and all experiencing with COVID-19. So the value of having a, a digital office as it were is that you have business agility, you increase your business agility, you increase your productivity, and you also have an IT infrastructure that is flexible and you can easily adapt um, and automate your, your backend processes. So the slide you can see on your screen now um, is all we fetch as PwC Digital Office Framework. We somewhat provide guidance on the digital components required for an organization to build a resilient digital office which I just described earlier. And so it talks about, if you look at the slide, um, about how employees will be enabled to connect to the office, the office is seamlessly. Office in this context is virtual. Could be a cloud infrastructure, or could be a physical office where you have a data center, or an outsourced service basis. So seamless connection that has good performance, little or no lag, um, but I know given the, our own local challenges in Nigeria, um, in terms of epileptic power supply or internet, and even in some cases we have colleagues who are restricted by the location and the space they can work from, and we have been interrupted. But also given that a lot of um, our colleagues and clients have families that are also locked, in lockdown with them, so we have children attending school remotely as well. So to put all those that mix together um, can become quite challenging in terms of the most working. So we're saying an organization that wants to enable a digital office environment for their staff um, should have a robust and for robust VPN infrastructure that has sufficient capacity that is able to ramp up um, capacity for additional employees that have to work from home or are working from their mobile remotely. We also see there are many opportunities out there in terms of digital technologies as well that can enable this to happen, um, such as having virtual desktop infrastructure um, where employees like that one asset is in um, this presentation about uh, the challenges of some of our institutions, international services, where some employees' desktops have to be taken to whether um, a call center or server room for the employees able to connect and support um, the bank clients. So VDI might be an opportunity to better the infrastructure um, to be able to, to, to scale that hurdle. And also collaboration in real time as well with colleagues. So you get to collaborate with your colleagues remotely you via your mobile or through your devices, your PC, your smartphones. We're also seeing that collaboration tools like email in real time video conferencing. Um, whether it's Zoom or WebEx or, or Google Chat. And then we're also talking about having ECM platforms, enterprise content management platforms, where 
in real time document sharing and collaboration. So SharePoint, productivity management suites as well. I'm also saying that employees should be able to connect to business applications, whether in native mode. And I gave an example of PWC where we have a ERP in the cloud, or Oracle Cloud, as an example. The other vendors that provide similar services. Salesforce, again, is in the cloud, contributes to managing our sales, our customer um, information. Um, and then you have core banking as well now, in some instances. I know about financial services institutions, um, I know one in particular, they have all their backend, front, middle, and backend processes being born and remote it. Um, a lot of FS clients are doing that, we have insurance and banking at the moment, where that is possible. Um, but the challenge has always been the seamless, um, straight through processing, automated processes. And to an extent, most of those processes are automated. Um, but not fully, so you still have some manual, some automated um, processes in between. And then business apps can also be provided on the employees' mobile phones as well. So you could you know, do some of your approvals um, seamlessly, go down on the ERP system through a mobile app. Um, you could also manage your customers and your clients through um, a CRM. Application on your mobile, on your desktop, mobile web. All opportunities, if you've not taken advantage of that yet, given the expediency and support upon us by COVID 19, this is our opportunity to very strong down from where we are now. And then, kind of to serve your customers in terms of business as usual. Again, we talked about um, customer care as well. And again, it's been performed remotely by most of our financial services clients and what we see in the industry. Um, and then some of the typical functions that I don't think I would have thought about a year ago, um, that a lot of our FS clients will be running from their, their, their employee homes um, in terms of operations, um, customer complaints, settlements, onboarding, um, I know some customers are also running bots as well. These are like software robots that can actually complete repetitive tasks. For example, in PWC, to raise a client bill, for example, and we have a tool called Emma that has a bot. And all you have to do remotely from the kind of your home, your smartphone, wherever you are, is type in the customer name, and the type of service, and automatically in the, the project number, and it can automatically generate an invoice for the client, um, which you can send um, digitally. So these are the various opportunities that organizations like yourselves can take advantage of and give in um, the experience it costs by this, by this pandemic. So that is just talking about the digital office. Um, and then lastly, for around this, this section of um, all this is governed by digital security. The thing I talked about is digital. When you're going digital, inherently it has a risk because you're talking about data. The data is what typically is the fulcrum of digital. And given that a lot of organizations are now working and colleagues to be working remotely as a new normal, this also increases the attack surface for who be cyber criminals. Um, because now there's a lot of employees that are giving laptops to give the experience and need to respond to COVID 19, who essentially haven't been properly trained in terms of working safely remotely. And so, someone who would be, like, would be a hacker, a criminal, with good social engineering skills, learning skills that sort of sniffing our network and phishing and all sorts of um, cyber attacks, potentially compromise systems and connectivity um, for employees of financial institutions that are connecting remotely. So it's important that as well as setting up the digital office, those who are are conscious of the fact that you're increasing your tax office as you're doing so. So putting in the right controls around governance, cyber security, and making sure um, that going digital doesn't compromise the existing controls that you have. 
because most of our clients are relaxed mobile controls so they have to get employee ABOC. It's critical to the operations and boarded pretty quickly and it's going to lose working. So I think it is an opportunity for us to reduce it. It's also trying to introduce more training. Um, and training can never be enough when it comes to cyber security because it's a moving target and things will keep changing to reflect our current realities. The next, the next slide um, talks about um, building a resilient digital infrastructure. That is an obvious in the previous slide. Uh, again, I refer to this stage in terms of how our clients respond to crises such as that restored upon us um, by COVID 19. Um, Again, opportunities will come up in terms of where we are in our response and stabilized needs. We can take advantage of to emerge stronger um, as COVID 19 burns down. So, what does opportunity look like for us um, in terms of what, what is your break glass procedure? So, now we know what our gaps are, given where we are now in response to COVID 19. So, what can we do better to emerge stronger? So if anything similar to this comes up again in the future, hopefully not, um, then have an opportunity to respond. So the first item on this slide is the business continuity plan. This plan also refers to in his own um, presentation. I know many organizations have financial services, given the amount of regulation coming in from um, CBF and you know, FEC and um, NCOM and NICOM in terms of the controls and what you have to comply with. Um, most of them don't have a BCP plan. Um, but what we also know is a lot of them end up in a cover or other sort of copy. This is meant to be living documents and will reflect your reality, your current reality, as you transform your business. So, in terms of even your BCP contacts and BCP journeys, um, your processes, then you've upgraded your IT systems, the new vendor you've onboarded, whatever risk the third party vendor has is also or will come to bear on your infrastructure. So managing your third party risk is also equally important. And this is important for us um, to be to be to recognize, to understand what what we're going through. The thing around any new regulation as well. We need to also include my BCP plan. So essentially what I'm saying here is you need to keep your BCP plan up to date. So when it comes to responding to crisis, it's a lot easier because it's a living document and you've done sufficient tests. Because also you're as good as your last BCP test or simulation to be able to cope with an impending crisis such as COVID-19. And I can also remember that after September 11th, we won't fit into attacks. Um, I enabled or United our organizations did that, um, BCP. A lot of organizations have a growing board to try and revise and update a BCP plan. Um, but as things have turned out, um, that are still not making a good foothold for a lot of organizations. The second one, Point around building a resilient digital infrastructure is also your digital and mobile strategy. In my research, we found that a lot of organizations pre COVID 19 were in the process of developing their digital strategy and mobility strategy or in the process of implementing their strategy. Um, and some of them have not completed that exercise yet. But this also presents an opportunity for organizations to be. Price and review this situation. Trying to leverage the digital opportunity that this phase that we're in provides. And also look at opportunities to develop the capacity and capability of providing a digital infrastructure. And also looking at the mobile workforce strategy. What are your key operational apps that you have? Your CRM, your core banking, or even your 
the, your, your ERP, and you provide um, those apps to your key workers that need to help promote you. This is about mobility as well. It's not just about working remotely. It's about mobility. So if they move about doing your business, you can also access um, the applications that are important for you to continue to serve your customer. The next one is around network planning and optimization. Um, the network, as we know, um, is a critical backbone to hosting and digital infrastructure. Digital workers. Being the new normal, um, it's also an opportunity for us to look towards building network capacity to support and remove workforce and remove management, either by implementing leading and emerging digital technology around network management, for example, um, digital network architecture, which enables to manage your, your digital network um, from the cloud. So your, all your Cisco routers and your network devices, an example, can be managed through software. And having your back office staff uh, be in the office or being physically present to manage that infrastructure, it can be done remotely. And also looking to optimize your network capacity as well, um, in terms of your VPN, ensuring they have a robust back end in your data center to the service provider and provide a uh, combination of video, uh, data, and bandwidth that can um, have enough robustness to, to sort of force you to uh, need of your digital workforce. So this last slide talks about other two top considerations. Cloud strategy. You know, I'd be surprised if any um, C-suite on this webinar or um, actually the decision makers in this webinar um, you know, haven't in recent times considered a uh, cloud first strategy given the constraints um, of the um, highly regulated industry um, as we know from my experience um, uh, the regulators um, you know, are, are not too favorable in terms of um, where transactional data from the various organizations are uh, kept. So uh, there's a limitation in terms of keeping traditional transactional data or customer data as it were, even in new uh, NDPR regulations in a foreign jurisdiction. That is not only south data, data center, that is not only south in uh, Nigeria. But this also will give the government an opportunity to consider um, how um, financial services industry could be enabled by uh, putting appropriate guidelines and control in place and have enabled financial services institutions to adopt a lot more cloud services to enable them truly digital and build a resilient digital infrastructure. One that would provide advantages such as capability, um, activity, and then to be able to respond in terms of, in terms of how to have a cloud first strategy. And in, in doing all of this, um, the other big part of maintaining a digital infrastructure is around digital security, which I mentioned in my previous summation. Um, because what digital infrastructure does is it gives a convergence of cloud computing mobile computing and social media. And this has created real problems in terms of maintaining data security at every point for every country. Um, so it's important that as part of us emerging stronger, we also conduct a careful assessment of the state of our office digital technology. I also find the opportunity that the digital strategy has developed pre COVID. Just look at where we are, look at what the gaps are, and that's a good opportunity to start implementing or updating based on what our new normal looks like now. It is important that we develop governance and framework and revise the relevant policies to enable us to be ready for any subsequent eventuality of to do with COVID 19. 
So I hope um, you know, I've been able to sort of lay down these considerations that we are going to see um, on the feeder to enable you to have a resilient um, digital infrastructure either from a digital office perspective and from a resilient or from being a resilient digital infrastructure. And I think on a, on a lighter note, um, I saw on, uh, on social media, I think it was some time ago, there was an image floating around asking people, um, organizations, what inspired their digital transformation. And the options are A, your CEO, B, your CTO, or C, COVID-19. So, thank you very much. I hope you found that useful. And I'll be taking your q and um, as we get to the q and session. So, pass you on now to you. Thank you, Alfred, for this, this deep insight. And the next talk for me is what we often tend to ignore, is that the business continuity plan is a living document. And as we begin to introduce new technology that change how we operate and how our business model uh, is structured, we always need to revisit it so that we are not impacted by the new risks that we might not have considered. So thank you very much for that. Uh, so we are now in the question and answer segment. As we mentioned at the start of the webinar, we would like to hear from you. Um, so please use the question and answer chat box at the bottom right of your screen. Like Alfred mentioned, you know, as you would imagine, it has done an assessment of our various digital strategies. And we are clearly seeing those gaps. So I reckon a number of us will have questions on probably how to, to address it to begin to adapt to the new normal. I have a question here um, already. I'll be directing that to Alfred. This is, what are the top uh, um, pain points that your clients have been most bothered about during this pandemic? Thank you, Toby. Um, I think that's a very apt question. Um, I think, like I said, when you response things, and a lot of organizations have not been, have never been in this situation where they didn't develop their functions and it only happened within the companies, their office building, the data center, um, able to work remotely. Um, but it one of the, the top, top tasks from clients is around Maintaining productivity. You know, how do you maintain? How do you measure, maintain, and increase productivity when people are working from home? You know, how 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 do you get the better visibility of performance data? Because for a lot of us, even at PwC, the FSI industry, um, where we have a lot of KPIs that cut across not just outputs, but in terms of how our colleagues interact and collaborate. That's how they measure. There's so many KPIs that need to be measured. The top question is how productivity is measured and maintained. Even though a lot of our colleagues are working in the So that's, that's a big one. And also around maintaining motivation and engagement. How do you motivate colleagues that are not being what to this extent that they have. Four weeks at home working remotely, have the kids in the background, and you have to maintain a home and also work from home. How do you have to keep motivating people? How do you get them constantly engaged? In terms of technology, um, a lot of it has been around producing plan strategies and digital strategies. Um, so, so that is where we've seen the, 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 the large upsurge in terms of questions and requests for services. Yeah, thank you, Alfred. Uh, next question will be for, for Damola. Um, the question is, how do we get to convince the regulator uh, 
the purpose drive a cloud first approach given the pandemic situation. So I mean, know that regulators are usually not pro cloud uh, with the recent privacy and security control. So do you think that they'll be more to, to shift ground at this time? Yeah. Thank you, David. Um, as I said earlier in my presentation, you know, this situation provided by has created opportunities to some of the nice sectors, such as video conference providers, uh, medical equipment providers. Also, they also provided opportunities for some of savory industries, like that of cyber criminals. So, increased digital working has increased their tax opens, like I said in my presentation. Many more people are not trained and not aware of how to work safely. Um, from home remotely and have been thrust with um, laptops and gadgets that um, they're not really accustomed to in their day-to-day -day working. So this has really sort of ramped up and we've seen um, from, from PwC um, command centers in terms of the rise in, um, in reported spike, or the rise of reported spike in cyber security incidents. So, spear phishing, mouse pounds, ransomware, using COVID-19 to impersonate brands, known brands. Um, because now you can have, can appreciate a lot of uh, finance processes but are also being automated and being approved. Vendor payments are being done from comfort to people's homes. People who are not used to the more working and being given responsibilities. Um, of being able to safely work from home. Um, and what is, what is also seen going up for as reason as well is the business remote compromise, which is a known, um, corporate, um, cyber security risk. Um, scams are also on the rise in terms of, um, the sort of, um, criminals that we've seen that, you know, stealing and attacking homes. Um, still using mobile phones and using um, normal hash, hash, hash for so doing USSD transactions. Um, again, that's been on the rise. So there's a lot of um, increase and spiking in cyber crimes, um, given the, the increase in the, in the tax office, um, and the number of people that are now working remotely. So this is also giving an organization an opportunity to also test more their controls and governance around cyber security. Um, it also gives you an opportunity to expedite some of your projects that you have packed previously, um, that um, your, 
there's a there's a there's an increase there's a, there's an increase in the risk for your organization um, to to be compromised. Yeah, thanks, Alfred. Um, and a follow-on to that question, which is also on um, security, but I'll pass that to you as well. Is uh, what are the basic IT controls banks can put in place to enable remote working? Um. So, 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 I mean. Training, conducting an awareness campaign and constantly training your staff um, because humans are always the greatest link. They can get processes and technology right, um, but humans have been found through various researches to be the weakest link. Um, because you always are strong at your weakest link, and that's typically humans. So I was opportunity to have attended um, a cyber resilience uh, conference, which Central Bank of Nigeria and JP Morgan, one of the leading investment banks globally, um, I think hosted sometime last year. And it was an eye opener for a lot of financial services industry attendants um, in terms of what the weakest big link is in, in cyber security. And even JP Morgan sort of told the audience that they sent test emails from time to time. Test whether people will open up attachments in an email that had um, a subject matter that was close to their heart or to the organization. So what they found out when they tested that that sort of email, you know, 80% of people still opened it up. And the second time they tried, believe it or not, it's just about 70%. So even though I've been on the so this is one of the ways in which we also try to educate and train our own people as well in terms of ensuring that people are aware. Sufficiently trained in how to respond um, to, to cyber risk when and if they occur. Um, another measure that could be that also implemented um, would, would be for banks to introduce and bring your own device policies. Um, and I don't think your own device policy, there's also some concerns, not just from financial services industry. Yeah, but also from other industries as well. That when employees are allowed to bring their own devices to work, um, it takes a bit of uniformity for support and maintenance. And the cost of support can actually go higher than it is now when you have uniform devices provided by, by the employer. What we also seen happen is where organizations combine bring your own device with technology such as virtual desktop infrastructure. What that essentially is is an employee's desktop or application that they typically use in the office is built and then put in a cloud and that can be pulled down from any device that the employee has, even their own personal devices. So there is a secure connection between the employee's personal device and the image of the application that they use to work for bank A or bank B or insurance company A or B through the secure connection. And also for mobile devices, for banks also implement what is called MDM, which is a mobile device management platform. So ensure all devices connected with bank resources are protected with latest control and compliance platforms. Um, so, so these are just a few examples of how um, banks can secure securely enable employees to work remotely. Right? Why not compromising um, the bank's operations? Of your, of your investment. Thanks, Alfred. Um, next question I'll direct to Damawa. For companies where their core applications are resident in house, how do you think the business can go on in this pandemic? Um, um, if the implementation of this to the information in the application, um, I mean, the application, they need to review the architecture of the application and ensure that this is accessible from uh, the DMS or uh, the whole idea is, instead 
Thank you very much, Damola. And um, without any more questions, this brings us to the end of our question and answer segment. Next on the agenda, um, we will be reviewing the survey responses. Um, feedback provided while we were registering for this webinar. And to drive that session, we will be doing Amosu. Lofi is um, an associate director in our, in our operations consulting unit. It has led many organizational change projects focused on business process engineering, cost optimization, economic transformation, digital strategy, target operating model, and finance function transformation. He's a fellow of ICANN and also a member of the Chapter Institute of Translation of Nigeria and is an ISO 9001 certified auditor and a certified process practitioner. Thanks to you for that warm introduction. Good afternoon all. I will be presenting the highlights of the COVID-19 survey for CIOs, CTOs, and Chief Data Officers. The survey was completed by survey executives across the financial services industry, and respondents cut across banking, insurance, asset management, and the pension sectors of the industry. Now, going on, going into the body of the survey proper, about that six percent of respondents estimate that the impact of the pandemic will last for six to twelve months. 28% of survey respondents of the view that the impact will last for three to six months, and 19% estimate the impact will linger beyond one year. Most respondents are concerned about the negative impact of the pandemic on the organization's revenue and profitability. About 41% of the respondents believe that it is difficult to predict the impact of the pandemic at this stage, while 57% are of the view that it will negatively impact their performance. Now, in terms of the key issues that the respondents believe they are facing now and will face as they go forward, the number one area of concern for technology executives is the likelihood of a global recession. Other concerns they have include cybersecurity at 49% and market volatility at 58%. The responses of the technology executives in this area aligns with the key concerns of chief risk officers in a similar survey. Now, moving on to how long it will take for the organizations to return to full operations. For 7% of technology executives estimate that their organizations will return to full operations within a month. While about 24% estimate that the post-pandemic recovery will be within three months. In essence, 71% of technology executives are confident that the organizations will make a full recovery within three months. On reflection, the outlook of a quick return to business as usual really doesn't seem to be aligned with the view of 64% of respondents that believe that the impact will linger for three to twelve months in addition to the concerns with respect to the likelihood of a global recession. In terms of investment decisions, 5% of respondents plan to delay any investment decisions. A third of respondents actually plan to invest more, while 19% would invest less. 
an equal number of technology executives, that's about 7%, indicate that the organizations will either exit investment or maintain status, status quo. I'll call on Toyebi now to give close the session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Doi. And with that, we have come to the end of today's session. We would like to appreciate you for your time. Uh, we hope you found the discussion instructive. Uh, we want to keep the engagement ongoing, so please feel free to reach out to us if you have additional questions. Uh, we noticed that some questions came after uh, we closed the question and answer session, but you can reach out to us. We are more than happy to provide responses to you. Uh, uh, we have uh, on our PwC website uh, additional talks and publications on COVID-19. These are very special for those publications. And uh, do stay safe and keep well during this period. Thank you for attending.